Well, hello everyone, and thanks so much for your patience as we kick things off today. We had a little bit of technical issues right up front, but I think we're right back on board. Hello, my name is Larry Perez. I'm part of the Climate Change Response Program for the National Park Service, and I really want to welcome you all to this fifth installment of the new National Climate Assessment Roundtable Series. And right off the bat, I kind of want to let you know that today's roundtable is going to go ahead and be live captioned with the kind assistance of Fed Relay. So. If you'd like to take advantage of that functionality, I encourage you to do so by using the link that we're going to go ahead and put in to the chat box at this time. Uh, this roundtable series is really intended to deliver area-specific information to units of the national park system within each of the 10 national climate assessment regions. These roundtables are exceptional opportunities to really learn about the latest findings from the 2018 assessment, ask questions of subject matter experts that you'll have on hand today, and have a dialogue with NPS leaders that are actively working on climate change issues within their respective parks. So today, we really encourage your active engagement and participation. Today's roundtable is going to focus squarely on parks within this northern Great Plains region of the assessment. If you should happen to be calling in from an area outside that region, that's okay. We still very much welcome your participation in this event. Just be aware that subsequent installments are going to focus on additional regions throughout the year. Recordings of all of our past events, as well as a full schedule of upcoming roundtables, uh, can be found using the link that we're going to go ahead and post in the chat box at this time. As part of today's call, we'll be hearing shortly from Dr. Valerie Small on findings, impacts, and actions from the fourth national climate assessment, particularly that northern Great Plains uh, regional chapter, followed by an open question and answer session. We're also going to have an open panel discussion featuring several invited guests from parks in the Northern Great Plains region, followed by a second round of questions and answers as well. And we're going to plan to conclude this broadcast promptly at 1.30 Mountain Time. Uh, I'm going to be one of two facilitators on today's event, so I'd also like to introduce my colleague Matt Holly, who's going to be helping us manage our tech today. And speaking of the tech, we want to share just a few quick words about it. All of the functionality of the webinar interface, provided that it continues working correctly, it's going to be access to this tiny little toolbar you find on your desktop. If the panels of the webinar interface aren't already visible, you can access them by clicking on the right arrow button at the very top of the toolbar. Be aware that your panels may minimize periodically by default. That's okay. You can set them to remain open by just clicking on View along the very top of the menu and deselecting the Auto Hide function. The radio buttons in your audio panel are showing you how you are currently connected right now to the webinar. For best quality, we highly recommend that you dial in via phone call rather than using your computer audio. If you're not currently connected, or I should say if you're currently connected by computer audio, you can go ahead and click on that phone call radio button and switch over to audio at this time and dialing in. We have quite a few participants on the line with us today, so by default all participants are muted to keep our background noise in check. But we're going to have a couple of dedicated question and answer periods during the roundtable, as I mentioned. These roundtables, again, are golden opportunities for you to ask questions of our invited experts and practitioners relative to your park and the challenges you face. So we really welcome you to bring your voice into the room, and there are two ways to do so today. If you have questions you'd like to raise during our question and answer periods, simply find the raise your hand button on your taskbar and we'll unmute you one by one to ask your questions. And just so everyone gets really familiar with that functionality, we'd like to ask that you go ahead and everyone within the sound of my voice, go ahead and raise your hand right now. And Matt will monitor your progress. I see him coming up. It means they are listening, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So anytime you want to voice a question, go ahead and raise your hand and we will unmute you to ask your question by voice. But you're also welcome to submit questions at any point during today's presentation. To do so, go ahead and use the questions panel at the very bottom of your interface. Matt and I are going to monitor for incoming questions and pose them to our speakers and panelists at the first available opportunity. But don't wait. Start asking your questions from now on throughout the session, and we'll have plenty of opportunity to have our invited guests address those. Finally, be aware that this session is being live, uh, is, this live session is being recorded for future reference and sharing online. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started. And I'd like to welcome Kat hawkins Hoffman, Chief of the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program to say a few words to kick off our roundtable. Kat? Lurking here in the background. 
All right. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to take any more time. I, I first want to thank Matt and Larry for dealing with a technical issue that everybody, I think, can appreciate. One of those forced Windows updates that happens to your machine at the most opportune time, which actually happened right at the top of the hour as we were ready to push start. So they got us through that, and thanks to everybody for hanging on during that event. Um, I, I really want to thank Valerie and Tom, Renee, and Jeff for participating in this and providing the information relevant to the Northern Great Plains and the climate change um, findings in the National Climate Assessment. This is such an important opportunity for parks. We're, we've worked hard to try to bring in excellent speakers that are practical and applied in your thinking to some of the issues and challenges that you face. And it's an opportunity for you to ask a lot of questions. So that's one of the main things I wanted to do is thank our speakers, but also encourage all of you to submit questions all the way along the line. We found in previous webinars that people often wait until the end. And we get a flurry of questions just as we're ready to and have to cut off the webinar. So please do make use of the chat box and enter your questions. Um, we consider this an informal opportunity. It, these are small webinars, and they are set up intentionally so you can interact. So please take advantage of that. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for dealing with all that. <laughs> it's part of the fun of these large webcasts. Thanks very much, Kat. I appreciate it. At this time, I'm really happy and very excited to welcome Dr. Valerie Small to our uh, panel today. Valerie recently joined Trees, Water, and People, based in Fort Collins, Colorado, as their new National Director of Tribal Programs. As a first-generation student to graduate with a college degree in her family, Valerie completed her PhD in Bioagricultural Sciences and Pest Management Weed Sciences Division from Colorado State University in 2013. Her interdisciplinary research was conducted on the homelands of the Crow tribe of Indians, the birthplace of her maternal grandfather. Val's experience includes teaching, research, and outreach at Little Bighorn College in Crow Agency, Montana. Her climate change adaptation experience includes co-convening a climate smart training course for tribes in the North Central region of the National Conservation Training Center and the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, and as an assistant research scientist at the University of Arizona's Native Nations Climate Adaptation Program where she co-developed and presented climate change adaptation training for tribes in the Southwest and conducted research to develop tribal-driven vulnerability assessments. Valerie, so glad you're able to make the time to join us today. We're going to pass the baton to you and let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. I appreciate this. Um, um, welcome. And uh, today what we're going to do basically is just go through some of the highlights of the Northern Great Plains chapter. Um, let me just uh, see how, if I can, so uh, basically today we're going to talk a little bit about the NCA4 assessment, how it's done, what it consists of, what regions does it cover, um, and then talk about our changing climate and how we know uh, that the climate is changing based on global temperatures, land and ocean, and projected changes in those global temperatures and then take it back to a regional human and natural influence on global temps and observed and projected changes in those average annual temperatures. Um, our key messages I really want to cover today that I've been asked is to cover specifically from this chapter is water, rec, and tourism, and indigenous peoples. And then we'll talk towards the end a little bit about some climate change impacts and adaptation strategies um, that are in those it, towards the end of the chapter itself. So the National Climate Assessment actually consists of two reports, one published in 2017, which is a science in which all of the climate um, uh, modeling is, is based on and is what our fourth National Climate Assessment published last year in 2018 is what we base um, what our findings are, particularly our changing climate regions. If you'll look at the slide, is we're concerned about the Northern Great Plains, but essentially it covers this, uh, this NCA4 uh, report covers um, 10 regions. Um, it is, it's a report that was um, organized uh, by 13 federal agencies and 
So I'm going to, because of time, kind of move forward through some of these uh, initial slides since most of you are already familiar with the report and uh, the basics of climate change and how we know that. So Earth is basically changing faster, resulting, you know, basically from the result of human activities. The impacts of climate change are already being felt uh, and Americans are responding, but neither global efforts to mitigate our causes uh, or regional efforts to adapt really is currently approaching the scales necessary to avoid any substantial damages. So if you look here on the left, top left, global land and ocean temperature anomalies from uh, 1880 until the year 2015, um, 1 1.2 uh, degrees increase for that period until 2016 um, compared to the uh, 1986 to 2016. The red bars show those temperatures that were above the 1901 to 60 average. The blue bars are indicating those temperatures that are um, below the average. Sorry, I've been trying to um, reduce this. Uh, never mind. Um, let's go on to all natural influences, the differences between human and natural influences. Both human and natural uh, factors have influenced the climate, but uh, long-term warming trend observed really over the past three can really only be explained uh, by the effect that human activities have had on the climate. Um, and these models essentially are showing at the top in A is all natural influences, uh, in B showing the all human influences, and C all human and natural influences combined. And as you can see with that etched line essentially is marked over where all human drivers are essentially trending right along with human influences and greenhouse gases increases. So observed and projected changes in annual, annual average temperatures across North America are projected to increase really proportionally greater and higher uh, at higher latitudes than lower and under a higher scenario, RCP, 8.5, which is right, as compared to the lower one in the left, which is the RCP 4.5. And it really compares observed changes for 86 to 2016 relative to the 1901s for the U.S., um, with projected differences in those average annual temperatures for mid-century in the center, in the middle, the 2036 to 2065, and then again at the end of the century, 2070 to 2099 for the bottom, relative to our near present, which is 86 to 2015. So our observed and projected changes in seasonal precipitation, um, as you can see at the top observed, the late 21st century higher scenario RCP 8.5 to the left for the winter and to the right on the spring, um, and then lower the summer and the fall. Historically, really, the Great Plains in northeastern U.S. have experienced increased precipitation, while the southwest has experienced a decrease for the same period of 1986 to 2015 when compared to 1901 to 1960, which is the middle and the bottom. In the future, under the higher scenario, or RCP 8.5, the northern U.S., including Alaska, is projected to receive more precipitation, especially in the winter and spring by 2070 to 2099 when compared to the 1901 to 1960 for the U.S. and 1925 to 60 for Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands. Parts of the southwestern U.S. are projected to really receive less precipitation in the winter and spring, and areas that are those red dots show where projected changes are large compared to those natural variations, and those areas that are hatched really show where changes are relatively small and insignificant. So I want to go through our key message number one, which is water, which is the lifeblood of Northern Great Plains, and essentially the effective water management critical to the region's people, crops, livestock, ecosystems, and particularly, as you know, um, for the National Park Service for recreation and tourism. 
Even small changes in precipitation have those large effects downstream. And when coupled with variation of extreme weather events that we are all seeing and witnessing this year, um, these changes make managing those resources a, a challenge. So some of those future changes in precipitation patterns, warmer temps, and potential for more extreme rainfall events are pretty likely to exacerbate these challenges. So if you'll see, I pulled some uh, information from various chapters other than the Northern Great Plains. So chapter three, if you'd like to read further on some of those um, key issues relative to water, um, they go into more in-depth, but changes in water quality and quantity are expected. Deteriorating water infrastructure are particularly at risk. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's particularly problematic in Indian country for indigenous peoples. And water management making, uh, water management particularly challenging in a changing future. And if you'll see to the right, this was taken by Doug Cluck and provided to me that he took last June in, of this year. And this is just south of Omaha. And of course, after the bomb cyclone, and then of course the extreme precipitation events that we've seen recently, this is what we are, is becoming to be more of a pattern uh, and a trend than unfortunately extreme weather event. So changes projected in US seasonal precipitation amounts for the late 21st century under the higher scenario of RCP 8.5. In the future, under the higher scenario, the northern U.S. is really projected to receive more increased precipitation, especially during winter and spring by 2070 to 2099 relative to 86 to 2015. Those areas where red dots are projected changes are really large compared to any natural variation we might expect. Those areas that are hatched really show where projected changes are small and relatively insignificant. One of the things that we just mentioned is this billion dollar weather and climate disaster event in the U.S. out of the third chapter really demonstrates how we see a, an increasing trend of the number of events and estimated damages for these extreme weather events that we're witnessing. And the number of those water-related billion dollar disaster events, for instance, tropical cyclones, flooding, and droughts combined each year in the U.S. Uh, with B and the associated cost in those to the right in dollars that are in 2017 dollars adjusted for inflation. So annual precipitation over the recent 30 years, 1986 to 2015, compared to the past, 1901 to 1960, as you can see in the northern Great Plains, particularly on the, what, the eastern side of the divide, um, is much more uh, problematic in terms of increase for annual precipitation. And um, on the western side of the divide, a little bit drier than average. So observed and projected changes in heavy precipitation, um, changes in total precipitation in the heaviest 1% of events. If you'll see from 1901 to 2016, which is the top left, compared to the 1958 to 2016, to the top right. Particularly in the Northeast and Midwest, those trends are projected to continue, and it shows the top numbers in black that sort of give the percentage of change and projected the bottom change in the amount of precipitation falling in the heaviest 1% of the events. An observed trend for 1901 to 2016 it really is calculated as the difference between the 1901 to 60 and the 1986 to 2016. Another flooding along I-29 uh, Upper Missouri River Basin flooding that was taken uh, just south of Omaha by Doug Cluck. So projected changes in very hot and cool days and heavy precipitation. This is a good, um, uh, it's a visual to show the lower scenario versus highest scenarios when it comes to changes in those number of days above 90 degrees. And then changes in the number of days below 28 degrees with the lower and higher scenarios in the center, and then change in the number of days with precipitation that exceed one inch by the mid 21st century. So you see the lower scenario on the left with the higher on the right. Hydrologic changes across the Northern Great Plains indicate average March snow water equivalent historical on the upper left, 
um, in average snowpack and annual stream flow, we expect stream flows to increase um, it earlier in the year, so seasonal changes, snowpack to be reduced in the upper level um, elevations. Um, so that takes us into really the key message three on recreation and tourism. So the ecosystems that provide these recreation and opportunities in our parks, um, we see rising temperatures resulting in a sort of shorter snower seasons. And these are gonna be present particularly in lower elevation um, snow areas, ski areas, and lower summer stream flows, increasing higher uh, temperatures in streams um, and having negative effects at higher elevation ecosystems in riparian areas that are really important uh, for the local economy and depend on winter and river-based recreational activities. Some of the things that um, Sorry, I'm having severe problems with uh, my keys that keep sticking. Um, apologies, market-based tools are some of the things that I wanted to just highlight from this um, figure that's out of Chapter 7 on climate change ecosystems and the services they provide. Um, private organizations have been partnering with researchers to develop payment for ecosystem services. And if you'll look, I think this is a great visual of looking at climate change and non-climate climate stressors and comparing those with the adaptive capacity to the adapt adaptation strategies, looking through how the, connect the connections are between biodiversity, terrestrial aquatic ecosystems, those services they provide, and in turn, how they affect human well-being. Some of the things that are pulled from the previous 2014 NCA 3 on the left really apply and are just exasperated. If you'll look on the left at climate change, impacts on ecosystems will actually reduce the ability to improve our water quality and regulate water flows. Those other stressors overwhelm the capacity of those ecosystems to buffer impacts that affect parks extremely, such as fires, floods, and storms. Those landscapes will basically change, particularly the species disappearing from regions where they've become prevalent or extirpated from some regions. So their um, mixes of plants and animal lives will become pretty much unrecognizable by the end of the century. So our timing of these biological events, spring bust, you know, bud burst, so phenology, emergence from overwintering, migrations will shift, leading to important impacts on the species and habitats. And whole system management is really what is necessary and for an effective way in which to um, prepare and uh, for these increase in climate disruptions. So regional ecosystem impacts, I'm sorry that this is a little bit more difficult to read probably than I would like, but I've included the uh, link where you can go and see, but I'll just highlight the Northern Great Plains area where it's the prairie pothole region which provides a really important wetland habitat for a majority of waterfowl that hatch in North America and warming temperatures and drought are projected to reduce wetlands um, in this region by 25% by the mid-century. And in land cover and land use changes for the prairie pothole region, this basically covers the Northern Great Plains prairie pothole and demonstrates between 2006 to 2011, these states where changes in area in thousands of acres have been converted from grasslands to corn and soy. So a grassland net loss significantly uh, for South Dakota, North Dakota, and Nebraska, not so much, and there wasn't any data really to calculate for Montana. But it's a growing trend that um, is something to keep in mind. So let's look at the reductions in the grassland area in that prairie pothole region. If you look at this figure, this basically shows in uh, grassland to corn soy land, soy percentage in the prairie pothole region along the Missouri River. It shows those recent changes in the corn belt, which threatens grasslands and the wetlands. Our final key message, number five, is indigenous peoples in basically a variety of climate impacts particularly resulting from hydrological changes, very similar to others, 
um, including in snowpack and seasonality and timing of precipitation and extreme flooding and drought, as well as the melting glaciers and reduction in stream flows. And these changes are already resulting in impacts to uh, tribal economies, livelihoods, sacred waters, and plant used for ceremony, medicine, and, and subsistence. At the same time, tribes have been very proactive. At least some of them are in adaptation and strategic climate change planning, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So let's look at the 27 tribes here are located within the Northern Great Plains region in one state, recognized tribe. Um, and these are the, the regions that, uh, and the tribes that some, to some extent have already either are in the process of planning for uh, climate change, so are, are in the vulnerability assessment phase, and or they're working on a climate adaptation plan. So out of the chapter 15, which is indigenous peoples chapter in the NCA4, some things that you might wanna look at and consider that tribes are faced with is that they are uniquely affected um, by a lack of infrastructure. If you'll see in the community infrastructure at the top left, they really are um, poor economic conditions that limit their ability to um, provide for adequate infrastructure to address an increased temperature and precipitation scenario. And then in the right, if you'll see regional systems infrastructures really lack those robust and redundant regional systems for transportation, communication, water, and power. It really increases their vulnerability to system damages and outages that disrupt businesses that are in uh, reservations and incur high costs to repair. And some of those essential services that uh, communities currently already lack in their uh, reservations, such as disaster responses, uh, policing, particularly health services, a uh, reduction in IHS funding that rely on infrastructure and local businesses and economies. These climate disruptions to community and regional infrastructure really act as additional strains on these um, tribal communities. Some of these additional strains that you might not be aware of are these reservation irrigation projects that are in, in extreme disrepair um, if you'll look at some of these um, irrigation projects on the Blackfeet, for instance, Flathead and Port Belknap, even in Crow and Fort Peck and Rune River, um, they're uh, faulty systems that are in desperate need of uh, repair. And in 2014 dollars, you can see that the total deferred maintenance for fiscal year 2014 with their replacement value is at about $491 uh, million. So a half a billion dollars, and I can guarantee that the BIA does not have that funding, um, and uh, nor does uh, most of the federal funding that comes in way of federal block monies to help with infrastructure, either maintenance or replacement. So it's, it's the communities that bear the brunt of having to come up with those funds to repair. As a case study, uh, my work that was conducted on the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana um, looked at the um, mapping the invasive species Russian olive within the Bighorn and Little Bighorn watershed systems. I looked at those and basically used a habitat prediction modeling tool, Maxent, in order to map and predict where, based on where the species is now, and that was in 2012, where will it go within 10 years using 22 climate variables? This was used uh, to produce a map that you see, and you'll see the warmer colors indicate a high predicted uh, uh, prediction um, for where that species will go based on where it is now. Um, and so the Crow Reservation essentially is kind of outlined, if you can see, and shaded in red. Um, and those purple areas that are in the map itself of from the model is basically outside of any suitability zone. Um, but it is indicative of the fact that it's going to continue to spread and unfortunately um, displace our current species such as cottonwood, willow, and some of our important food sources such as chokecherry, buffalo berry, and wild plum that are really used as traditional food sources for a lot of the Plains Indian tribes. 
So out of the that chapter 15 from the Indigenous Peoples, these are the climate initiatives and plans that you can see broke out. And I wanted to highlight that really a lot of the Northwestern tribes have been have done a very good job in their planning and assessment and ad adaptation and implementation. We're getting some of our tribes in the Northern Great Plains area to move beyond uh, the planning and assessment into monitoring and research. Um, but you can see that we have some work to do in our Northern Great Plains area to help tribes to move uh, beyond um, and the, move beyond the uh, assessment phase, vulnerability assessment into actual climate planning stage and developing adaptation strategies to meet these growing changes. So I want to talk a bit about climate impacts and adaptation that are, that are occurring across the Northern Great Plains. And these are, this is a, it, it's in the 20, the chapter, the Northern Great Plains chapter. And what it, we've done is essentially I've cropped out the bottom part to make it easier to read to highlight some of these adaptation strategies. For instance, on the upper left on the number one, the impact is really flash droughts and high heat events. So a challenge that, you know, meeting sustainability of ranching um, and that an, an adaptive management framework developed through science partnerships and proactively increase flexibility and operational decision making will reduce an, their economic and ecological risks. On the opposite side, number three, I want to highlight the rising temperatures that increase these invasive species, such as what I just showed you on the Crow Reservation on the invasive Russian olive. So it really threatens the culturally, um, the cultural expression of the Crow tribe and also threatens all of their food sovereignty initiatives by limiting and extirpating some of those species that they come to depend on to reverse back to a more traditional food-based uh, diet in Crow country. And some of the responses that were adapt adaptation responses were done by the USDA NRCS Crow Agency, where we worked with the Little Bighorn College students to remove some of those invasive uh, populations of Russian olive along the river, and then revegetated plains cottonwood in some sandbars and developing riparian buffer zones. So those are just some examples of ad adaptation strategies that can be done in order to mitigate some of these um, climate-driven uh, uh, um, invasive species um, challenges that we face in Indian country. Um, our chapter author team uh, is obviously Doug Cluck. Noah actually led the NCA4 report, and um, I was really honored to be uh, considered part of this uh, huge two-year effort and uh, that to have some of the work that was done on the Crow Reservation highlighted in the Northern Great Plains area since a lot of uh, the parks, and I'm assuming all of the tribes within the Northern Great Plains region have issues with invasive species, particularly Russian olive and riparian systems. So I'd like to acknowledge Alyssa and Kristen and Doug, and of course, Larry Perez. Um, thank you very much for um, all of your hard work and for allowing me to present the NCA4 highlights and the chapters. Um, and this is a recommended chapter citation. You can read the full chapter at the Global Change um, link that is on the screen as you can see it. And I uh, appreciate the time that you have taken um, to spend with me. And I think I'll need to turn this over so we can move forward due to our initial problems with uh, some of the um, the communications that we've had today. It's been like I said, a Monday and a Tuesday. So I'd like to thank you in my native tongue, Aho, Kashila, and thank you for joining us. And I'm open for questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. Really appreciate that. And yeah, thank you for being so quick on your presentation. I know you did that as an adaptation, as it were, to that snafu we had at the start of the presentation. So thank you for that. Uh, this is your time. Participants on the line, we've got, my goodness, about 67 attendees with us today. Uh, now is your time uh, for questions you might have regarding uh, the realities of what's happening with the climate in your particular region. Again, there's two modalities for asking those questions. You can either ask them via the questions panel, 
or feel free to raise your hand now and we can unmute you and bring your voice into the room. Happy to do that. No hands are raised yet, but uh, I know there might be people typing in questions into the questions box. And we will have more Q&A at the end as well. So even if you're taking a little bit too long to transcribe your question and get it in there now at this point, by no means give up if, if we're moving on because we will have a chance to come back to Valerie uh, at the end of this presentation as well. So we're just taking you a little bit to conceptualize it and get it down. No worries, just keep working on it. Um, you're, you're not gonna be too late. There's one question that came in um, it was asking about what type of site-specific sensors are deployed. I don't remember quite what this was in reference to as I was doing some behind-the-scenes stuff here. So hopefully, Valerie, you're uh, remembering what that would be asking about. Um, well, I, I need to clarify if this was about the model, the Maxent model on the Russian olive. I'm not real sure what what it's in reference to. I think I need a bit more information. Go ahead, Tad, if you want to do a follow-up to that um, with, with more specific info, and then we'll make sure we get that uh, to Valerie either now, if we will still have time, or if it takes a little too long, we can do that at the end as well. Matt, do you want to go ahead and unmute Tad, if you just want to elaborate by a voice? Let's yeah, let's, like, let, let's give that a try. Tad, you're on your computer audio, so it may or may not work, but I'm going to give it a try to unmute you. And so if you do have a little microphone sensor on your computer, you might be able to respond directly to us. Uh, okay. Tad, are you I, there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go for it. Right. Uh, I'm interested in looking at the micro scale changes to uh, topography, subsidence, and, and similar anthropogenic changes along the Louisiana coast. And we're going to be deploying sensors. And I'm just wondering, as have y'all deployed sensors in a site-specific locale in the uh, region? Or you're collecting all your data from uh, your modeling modeling it using Maxent data, right? Environmental data. Um, okay, I think you might be talking about the actual climate sensors yes. versus the Maxent model, which was run using 22 climate variables for a specific time and place and projections on uh, where future habitat will determine where that species will spread. So I think there might be two different uh, areas there. Yeah, there, that, there are. I, I'm not making myself clear. I guess my, my question is, are you deploying sensors at site-specific locations to collect data? Well, uh, for the research uh, on the reservation, is that what you're referring to? Sure. Or in general? Both. Um, no. Uh, basically, the model was run from mapping Russian olive. So it's, okay. it's a model to project uh, habitat species prediction tool uh, mm -hmm. to determine based on where it is now, where will it be in the future? And that was in 2012. Okay. Um, okay. And then as far as sensors go, it may be that you're talking about utilizing a more regional um, and micro scale approach to identify anything that might be influencing extreme weather events and or um, is that what you're speaking about? Yes. Yeah, now about about the NCA4, I'm not sure that I can speak to whether we're doing that in the Northern Great Plains or not, but okay. I think that given the level of uncertainty in uh, ecosystem determination on whether or not where at 
actually this will go um, for the Park Service and Ecosystem Services because it will depend on land use change over time. It will also depend um, on extreme weather events in your region. Um, and so changes in precipitation um, are going to be variable based on where you are at regionally and at the micro scale. So certainly you can utilize some of the weather station information um, and look at NOAA uh, for some of the direction on where that might go in the future and to help yeah. you with predictions and to prepare uh, your climate adaptation plans accordingly. Thank you, okay. Valerie. Thank Appreciate you that. Much. Excellent. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate the question. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate the response. And uh, we see a few more questions coming in through the questions box. But for the sake of time, I think we'll move into our panel discussion. As Matt mentioned, Valerie's going to hang out with us. She's graciously agreed to hold on the line and continue the discussion into this next session. So, that, Valerie, thank you very much for that. At this point, I'm showing you just a few of the key takeaways from Valerie's presentation. We're going to revisit these a little bit later on in today's presentation as well. But for right now, I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Tom Olive. Tom is the National Park Service Intermountain Region Division Chief of Landscape Conservation and Climate Change. And he works to help 84 parks throughout eight <coughs> Western states connect with conservation partners and incorporate climate change into management decisions. His prior work includes stints as the co-coordinator of the Great Northern Landscape Conservation Cooperative, the coordinator of the Greater Yellowstone NPS Inventory Monitoring Program, and chief of resources for Yellowstone National Park. And he's currently serving in a collateral detail as the Department of the Interior Liaison for Secretarial Order 3362, which is on improving habitat on big game winter range and migration corridors for the states of both Montana and Idaho. Tom, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to pass the baton over to you. Thanks so much, Larry. Um, can everybody hear me? Matt, I guess Matt, can, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, so for the second part of the presentation, uh, I just really wanted to um, share some climate change stories. And um, I think stories are powerful in helping us to uh, understand the climate change science and understand the impacts, helping us think about how we're going to adapt and connecting with each other. And um, so I'd like to introduce Jeff Mao, but before I do that, I think, Matt, we had a, a couple of poll questions we were going to um, ask folks to fill out now, the first two. All right. Yeah, Tom, uh, the first poll question, was that the one you want to do? What level of concern do you have about climate change? Is that right? Yes, and then maybe the second one as well. Okay. So I'm going to launch a poll. This is your chance to give some feedback. I've just launched it. It'll appear on everyone's screen now. What level of concern do you have about climate change? with a range of five options, extremely concerned, very concerned, somewhat, slightly, and not at all. So go ahead, uh, all of the attendees have a chance to vote. Panelists, I'm sorry, you do not actually get to vote. This is only for the attendees. So far, over two thirds of people have submitted their response. I'm gonna sit tight for a few more seconds because they, they still keep trickling in as people find it, uh, they, uncover their go-to webinar window, which had been hid behind their email. Uh, we're over three quarters. I'm gonna go ahead and close this one for now and then share the results with all of you. I will share, this will pop up on your screen. What level of concern do you have about climate change? 60% of people said extremely concerned, while 33% said very concerned. So we're at 93% within those two categories. 4% said somewhat concerned, 2% said slightly, and no one said not concerned. So about 93% in the uh, the top two categories there. And then Tom, should I, I'll go right on like you said to the next one. Um, I'm gonna launch your second poll question. What level of concern do you think your visitors have about climate change? All right, you've got the same five options, extremely, very, somewhat, slightly, or not concerned. What levels do you think your visitors have? Go ahead and submit your answers there, and then I'll close this one as we get a little higher up. We've had over half of people responding so far. I think this one can be a tougher one to, 
to answer, especially maybe you might not be in a park, maybe you're in more of a, a regional office setting. Uh, but could you just go ahead thinking about your, your visitors as a whole, which we all ultimately serve. So we're about two thirds. I'm gonna go ahead and this one, I'm kind of loving this. If you look up a textbook of a bell curve, you would find the results of this poll pretty much. Um, with a very steep bell curve, but pretty much equal on all sides. You will see that exactly two thirds of respondents, 67% said somewhat concerned. 13% said very concerned and 13% said slightly concerned. <laughs> so an exact mirror image on either side and then extremely concerned 5%, not concerned 3%. So we are basically a triangle, a, a bell curve. We think our visitors tend to be in the middle. Uh, a few people we think more on the, the two ends of that spectrum. But a very balanced distribution of this and kind of a, a, a difference to what we saw with the first poll result where 93% of us were in the top two categories. Uh, thanks very much, interesting results. Okay, I'd like to introduce our two two storytellers, I guess, today, um, Renee Ohms and Jeff Mao. I've asked Jeff to, to start us off, um, and Jeff's the superintendent of Glacier. Many of you know him. He's been there since August of 2013, but his first visit to the park was actually in 1988 when he was fighting fire on the Red Bench Fire in the North Fork of the Flathead. Jeff graduated from college and then went to University of Michigan for his graduate degree in geology. But he gave his 31 years with the Park Service in Alaska, where he began as a seasonal ranger at Glacier Bay, served several assignments all over Alaska, and then um, later was the superintendent of Kenai Fords and acting superintendent of Denali. In 2001, Jeff um, was the 12th Bevanettos Fellow and then moved to Florissant Fossil Beds. And um, interestingly, Jeff has been um, working on climate change a lot longer than most of us. He was on the Department of Interior's Climate Change Response Task Force during the Bush administration. And he completed one of the very first details with the fledgling NPS Climate Change Response Program in 2010. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let's see, I get my uh, presentation. There we go. I've gotta do the same adjustment, I think, to... You're looking good, Jeff. We see it just as normal on your screen. Oh, terrific. Great. All right. Well, um, you know, I just might make a quick comment on that last poll because of uh, some of the social science uh, that uh, was done at Kenai Fjords was there. But, you know, the social science that has been done in parks really shows a very different result of where our publics are in terms of their level of concern. And uh, since I've learned about that, so probably over 10 years now, every year I go to my um, interpreters and try to speak to them about you know where our publics are coming from what social science is telling us about the concern of our public visiting our parks and that how important it is that if we're not talking about climate change we're not addressing their needs so uh, maybe Larry later on will show the actual result from some of that research but um, yeah it's pretty surprising where our publics are in terms of their concern of or climate change. Uh, we don't, we're not really seeing a, a normal cross-section of, of America. So um, like Tom said, I, I've been involved in the climate change business for, for quite some time. And uh, um, I'm going to share a few things that, that, that I've learned. And uh, I'll cite my story uh, just about a year ago um, here at Glacier National Park. Um, we were just coming off a record winter in terms of snowfall. Uh, but as Valerie noted, you know, with, uh, with extreme spring temperatures, the snowpack melts off very, very quickly. So we had a record short uh, spring season in terms of snow melt. And we were very quickly into uh, abnormally high temperatures, low fuel moistures uh, through most of the summer. And then August 10th, we set a new record high temperature for Glacier National Park. And August 11th, we had thunderstorms come through. Uh, you know, that lightning bust started about uh, 19 fires in, in northwest Montana. Um, 
the one on the screen is uh, the one that uh, fire started in in what was the old uh, Robert fire burn from 2003. So this is normally uh, a fuel type that doesn't burn a lot. Um, we've had fires there the previous two years. They never got above more than a tenth of an acre or an acre in size. But in you know we something tipped in uh, 2018, and we saw this fire really take off. And and uh, we put um, heavy uh, suppression efforts on it early on. But uh, you know in less than 24 hours, this fire really blew up. And and it, we have the dubious distinction of uh, the Howe Ridge fire from Glacier National Park in 2018 is on the cover of the fourth national climate assessment. And that's really sort of my tenure here at Glacier has been sort of dominated by wildfire. Three out of the last four years we've had large fires in the park. Um, you know, my I guess if you want to call it my scorecard, uh, we've burned two historic districts and we've burned one national historic landmark in that process. So. Um, but it's, it sort of speaks to, um, I think, sort of what we're seeing now as, as uh, climate change manifests itself at Glacier National Park. And certainly the loss of the Sierra LA dormitory was one of those uh, dominant uh, 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 losses that we had, significant losses. Um, we are in the process of, of rebuilding it at this point. But I think for, for, for many, many years, you know, the story of climate change uh, at Glacier National Park really was about the loss of our glaciers and the well photographed, well documented uh, loss of glaciers in the park where uh, when the park was first established we had I think on the order of 130 uh, glaciers in the park and now we're down to um, just about 30 left and uh, they continue to shrink uh, with the conditions we have. And really you know I get asked a lot by the media about you know the loss of glaciers. Are we going to get a new name? And and really, you know, the, that that's you know to talk about just the melting glaciers themselves is just the tip of the iceberg. No pun intended. Uh, about the real impacts to the ecosystem and to species within the ecosystem uh, from the lack of those cold waters. You know, those cold water species that have developed in the park really, you know, are are some great examples of, of uh, what's being impacted by climate change. Also some of the vegetation, five needle pines definitely are seem to be struggling. They're, they're a focus of some of our big restoration efforts as well as some of our fisheries. Bull trout in particular is a species that's fairly unique to uh, uh, this corner of the world that uh, we're, we're pulling out a lot of stops in order to try to give that uh, species an opportunity to adapt over time. I often speak about Glacier National Park as being in the sweet spot of vulnerability. And, and what does that really mean? Well, I think our geography is kind of unique here at Glacier. We're really a mid-elevation section of the, or maybe even a low-elevation section of the, of the Rocky Mountains. Um, our highest peaks are about 10,000 feet. You know, our high mountain passes are only about 6,500 feet. Um, you know, you compare that to Rocky Mountain National Park where and Trail Ridge Road where, you know, it's over 12,000 feet. So those, those sort of mid-level elevations are really make us vulnerable to small changes in temperature. Um, and, you know, that affects precipitation or how precipitation comes. Um, it really makes, uh, creates a, a vulnerability that, of course, impacts our glaciers and now we're finding out also has great influence on uh, wildfire um, and how they burn in the park as well. You know looking at our fires from the past two years we're also starting to see some patterns that have never been seen before. We have pretty good uh, records going back almost a hundred years for this part of Montana showing that you know the, the pro most of our fires burn in the direct direction of the prevailing winds which is uh, moving from the southwest to the northeast. But over the last couple of years, our fires that have been burning in the park have been moving from the northeast to the southwest in the opposite direction. And they've been driven a lot by these backdoor fronts that come in uh, with very strong winds and uh, you know start blowing the fires in, in directions we haven't seen before. And, and uh, that's, that's, you know, two years really isn't a trend, but it certainly is something we're taking a good look at. and. Uh, 
uh, you know, we're starting to see some of those changes in prevailing winds uh, in other places as well as, uh, in terms of meteorology. So looking at the uh, Northern Great Plains Climate Assessment, I thought I'd just touch on three of the, the key message areas that, that uh, probably the same ones Valerie did, and, and the first being water. You know, um, last year was the second year of something called a flash drought. I'd never heard of a flash drought before, but uh, the Weather Service explained that's when you have a, a record snowpack and yet you get no precipitation during the summer months. Therefore, all your surface water systems uh, tend to go dry or, or get very, very low. Um, doesn't mean the groundwater's uh, having issues, but it's just the, those surface waters. So, uh, new term, uh, new uh, observations we're having in that. And of course, that affects our our cold water fisheries um, and uh, you know certainly the availability of surface waters for a variety of things. Working with our tribes, uh, predominantly the Blackfeet and the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, um, certainly as neighbors, you know we we're, we all suffer some of those impacts, and some of those impacts include you know again the impacts of flash droughts, the availability of water. Um, you know what we've seen in, in as you know, I like to describe climate change. It's almost like somebody's turned the volume up on the uh, on the weather. It gets more intense, and past two winters we've seen significant um, losses of livestock on the reservations uh, uh, due to the extreme temperatures. Interestingly enough, um, bison, which exist on the landscape, do not seem to suffer so much in the in, in the winter time. And in fact, we're very excited about one of our initiatives to reintroduce. Um, working with the Black Pea to reintroduce uh, a free-ranging bison herd back to the reservation um, as, as part of uh, an, an what we call the Yanni initiative. Moving on to recreation, we've had a um, explosive growth of recreation. We, our uh, visitation, our visitation grew about 40% in uh, two years, mainly between the years of 2016-2017. Even to the extent where in July 2017, Glacier had more recorded visitors for the month than Yellowstone. And I can tell you, there's absolutely no way anybody ever designed Glacier National Park to have more visitors than Yellowstone. So there's a lot of uh, recreational impacts, um, visitation impacts uh, that come with that on wildlife, on resources, on infrastructure, and certainly uh, on staff. Uh, when you get uh, crushing visitation like that. And we think a lot of that visitation is, is driven by one, uh, social media certainly plays very, very well. Uh, the increasing demand for outdoor recreation, which is uh, growing by, they say, almost 4 million people a year, retirees who are uh, wanting to be more active and involved in outdoor recreation, as well as there's a very strong interest in seeing the glaciers before they melt. So. Um, Again, you know, uh, climate change related uh, impacts to our recreation. So, but, um, you know, again, outdoor recreation, what do people want to do when they're here, uh, is also changed a little bit. And, uh, um, yeah, it seems like, you know, that selfie generation, what, what, how it's changed uh, visitor use patterns. But, uh, you know, what we, so we've gone from some years from having a million visitors in one month having fires in the park that closes the going to the Sun Road, one of our primary uh, visitor venues. And uh, that's proven very challenging in terms of uh, how we manage that. Um, it's been uh, certainly for our staff, it means um, huge adjustments in, into the jobs uh, that they may do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, really, as I look at um, the issues of climate change, wildfires, increasing visitation, I come to the conclusion that there's really very little Glacier National Park alone can do, and it almost always involves uh, getting involved with partnerships. And uh, we're lucky here that uh, Glacier has been involved in some large landscape partnerships for, you know, almost 20 years. Crown Managers Partnership, uh, uh, Roundtable on the Crown Continent are probably the two of the partnerships that that um, have been around the longest, and climate change is a constant thread in those venues. Some of the newer partnerships is the Crown of the Continent uh, uh, 
uh, Geotourism Council uh, that National Geogra Geographic helps underwrite, as well as an, an, the newest organization is our Climate Smart Glacier Country, where we're collaborating with businesses, utilities, and communities to look at you know, how we can be more climate smart, how we can be more responsive on the issues of climate change uh, in this part of Montana. And again, you know, partnerships, uh, I call it all hands on deck. A lot of uh, agencies, organizations, NGOs um, all get involved in, in a, a number of these issues. And almost all these uh, agencies that are shown on here have some focus on climate change, that they recognize uh, its importance, have adaptation plans, and uh, collaborate with us on those needs. Um, communities, I, I often say I've never worked in a national park where I felt like the communities are so connected. And so for me as a superintendent, um, going to these communities, being in these communities, talking about climate change, talking about the uh, issues and challenges we have as an agency, um, it's been very comfortable for me. And uh, I, you know, at first maybe uh, that'd be surprising, but uh, really, I think um, you know with some of the changes we're seeing in, in climate um, around us. I mean, everybody sort of gets it uh, these days. But one of the things that concerns me the most is is about our staffs, our organizations. And here at Glacier, we'll have a staff of almost 450 uh, employees at the height of the season, thousand concession employees, hundreds of volunteers in the park on any given day. And and how do we keep them adaptable and flexible in the face of so much uh, climate uncertainty. And so I've put a fair bit of effort into sort of thinking, trying to get my staff to think scenarically about, about the future, how to think about, you know, that, that there's so much uncertainty, we have to think about all the possible plausible ways that, that the future could look. And, um, you know, in many respects, um, instead of having people think, you know, sort of focused on, on forecasting to, towards one future, I try to have my staff think more scenarically about the multiple possible uh, futures. And, and it's not unlike when you go for a day hike here in Glacier National Park. Uh, you carry a headlamp in case it gets dark. You carry bear spray in case you run into a bear. You bring a first aid kit in case you get hurt. No uh, certainty those things are going to happen, but you are prepared for those uncertainties. And that's kind of the the sort of way I like to approach my staff to sort of be mentally prepared for uh, whether it's fire, whether it's visitation, you know, we'll sort of get whipsawed around, but it isn't something that we haven't sort of thought, thought as a possibility moving forward. So, so those are just sort of um, some real high level uh, overview thoughts I have on, on the issues of uh, what we're seeing here in the Northern Great Plains in terms of, of change uh, associated with climate change. And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn that back to Tom. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, really interesting stuff. So we're going to move from um, kind of the west side of the Intermountain region to the boundary between the Intermountain and the Midwest region. And um, I'm going to ask Renee Olms, who is the Chief of Resource Management at Devil's Tower, to share her climate story. She's been with the Park Service for 20 years um, um, at Devil's Tower since 2013. Her and Jeff arrived at the same year. Um, prior to that, she worked for Jewel Cave and Wind Cave and with the Northern Great Plains Fire Management Office. She served details with Badlands and Fossil Butte. And I think significantly, and, and the reason I know Renee, is that um, she actually uh, agreed to, to let us work with her and with Devil's Tower and the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center to help to integrate scenario planning into the resource stewardship strategy process. And that was the very first time we were able to do that in, in, a, in a really robust way. And that's um, actually taken off across the service now. So Renee, um, thank you for joining us and um, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks Tom. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And I, I don't have any slides to share with you, but uh, you do get to look at a beautiful picture of Devil's Tower while I'm speaking. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Devil's Tower, uh, we're up in northeastern Wyoming, and we're only 1,347 acres. And so uh, really the effects of climate change can feel a little bit 
overwhelming and kind of out of your control uh, when you're in a park this size. And we, we feel a bit like a postage stamp in the landscape sometimes. Um, and as of just a couple years ago, uh, really before I met Tom, uh, we had only a cursory understanding of the potential effects of climate change on the resources at Devil's Tower. And we hadn't really drilled down into the specific climate models for the park um, until last year, until this um, RSS effort. So, you know, I find it's, it's really hard to know how you should respond to climate change and what management actions you can take until you really have a handle on what's likely to occur. So, uh, we started our resource stewardship strategy last year, and as Tom said, we integrated climate change scenario planning into that process as a pilot. And the idea is to just make sure that our, the resource activities that we're prioritizing in that RSS and the management decisions that we're making are taking into account climate predictions and their associated resource stressors. And so our RSS is um, almost done. It's in the final review stages now, and it'll be completed this summer, which I'm really excited about. And I really think that if we hadn't integrated climate scenarios into the RSS process, uh, we probably would have missed some key resource stressors and we would have missed some key activities that would really help us adapt uh, to the effects of climate change. So I'm just going to pull up my notes here. Oops. Sorry, my computer is acting strangely. I lost my cursor. Anyhow, so, um, so what does all this mean? So we've got uh, the good folks at the climate change response a program and USGS came up with um, four likely climate scenarios um, that we are likely to see happen here at Devil's Tower. And um, what was really interesting to me is that these are scenarios that are equally likely to occur between 2025 and 2055. And for me, that was one huge takeaway is that really the future is now. I mean, the 2025 is just right around the corner. And so climate change is something that is it's happening, it's happening now. A lot of people think of it as something that is far out, but we're already seeing those effects. Uh, so all of these, these four climate scenarios that the Climate Change Response Program and USGS scientists came up with um, are all equally likely to occur. And all of them at Devil's Tower show a warming trend, increases in the annual mean temperature. Um, some are more severe than others. And uh, but a lengthening of shoulder seasons. So we see uh, many of the scenarios have a, a warmer springtime. Uh, two of the scenarios also show really significant increases in the number of days that we'll see that are over 96 degrees Fahrenheit. So for us, that's really hot. Um, and uh, one of the surprises for me was that many of the scenarios also show an increase in precipitation. I mean, a lot of people think of climate change as global warming, it's just about warming, um, but we're also going to be seeing increases in precipitation. And uh, so a couple of these scenarios also showed an increase in really large precipitation events uh, that are greater than one inch uh, per day. And we're already seeing some of that this spring. Um, so what are some of the effects that we're going to see happening right here at Devil's Tower? And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we're thinking is very likely is that we're going to have increased flooding, especially if we have these large precipitation events. Uh, we're going to have increased erosion, uh, increased fire, uh, wildland fire potential, especially with those uh, very hot scenarios, uh, changes in the vegetation composition, um, increased visitation because of the favorable weather during the shoulder seasons. And uh, Jeff talked about that quite a bit um, up at Glacier. And we're going to see the same thing here. Uh, also, difficulty in implementing prescribed fire projects, because when you think about it, we may find limited windows of opportunity where we could actually burn and meet the weather and fuels prescriptions for those fires. So I'm just, I'm just going to highlight, and um, with the time we have left, a few of the key resources and uh, some of the impacts that we could see to those resources and how we plan to respond uh, here at Devil's Tower. And uh, first of all, one of the one of the main things, especially because we're going to be seeing increased erosion, is we're expecting that we're going to see exposure of previously undocumented resources, especially paleontological resources and archaeological resources. And so in response, I think we really need to ensure that we have good inventories of those resource types 
and that surveys for them are conducted at regular intervals so that we are finding those resources as they're exposed. Um, you know, and this is really likely to be an issue at many parks in the Northern Great Plains. Um, one park that really comes to mind for me, since I, I just finished a detail at Badlands National Park, um, and uh, you know, there the erosion rates are just already mind-blowing, and if they were to increase even more, uh, significant fossil resources uh, could, could be potentially a risk. Um, also, an, another effect that we expect to see is a change in vegetative composition and a potential shift in some cases from open meadows to forest um, or the other way around. Um, the tower is a significant sacred site for over 20 associated tribes, and ceremonies have occurred here for uh, many thousands of years. And there's one open meadow area in the park um, that is still used frequently for ceremonial activities. And encroachment of pines into that meadow would affect that traditional use. And if we're unable to keep the meadow open uh, through prescribed fire activities, um, we're now considering um, other methods, including mechanical removal. And this is an issue that we're working closely on with, uh, with tribes on uh, through collaboration and consultation. We just had a consultation meeting last October where we were discussing the treatment of that particular area. And uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll skip the next one that I was going to discuss, but you know, there's many effects of climate change that were identified at Devil's Tower through the series of workshops that we held uh, for the climate change scenario planning and the RSS effort. And I'll just highlight one more, um, and that is that increased visitation. And again, you know, Jeff talked about that at Glacier, but especially in those shoulder months. Um, historically, you know, the highest visitation at Devil's Tower has been roughly between Memorial Day and Labor Day, and uh, now that'll begin to creep into other seasons, and that's going to translate to a need for increased facility maintenance, uh, trail maintenance, visitor services, uh, visitor protection. And uh, yeah, Jeff used the, the term crushing visitation, and it, you know, we're seeing that here, too. Um, our visitation has now increased to over 500,000 visitors a year, and our facilities were built for 20,000, um, approximately 20,000. So, you know, if we start to see, you know, warmer weather in the shoulder seasons, we're going to be seeing increased visitation. And also, if we see some major increases in those extremely hot days, those days that are over 96 degrees Fahrenheit, then we'll also see an increase in heat-related illnesses and a greater need for EMS responses. Um, also, just uh, wanted to touch on a couple of the local partnerships here. Also, um, in addition to partnering with the tribes, uh, we've also partnered with universities. Um, University of Montana, uh, Dr. Diana Six, she's been looking into the potential for ponderosa pines to show a natural genetic resistance to drought and to mountain pine beetle. So if we can identify these trees, perhaps we could prioritize protection of them, especially in key areas uh, where they're most desirable. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I had about Devil's Tower. I just really want to uh, thank Gregor Skirman, um, Amber Runyon, uh, also from the Climate Change Response Program, uh, Amy Simstead with USGS, and Brian Miller, also from USGS, um, you know, have been instrumental in all this, and Tom for connecting all of us. Uh, there's actually going to be a paper forthcoming on the work at Devil's Tower uh, through the Natural Resources Report series. So you can look forward to that later this summer. It's in the peer review process right now. So um, with that, I think I left about five minutes in the, in the webinar. So I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thanks, Renee. Um, and thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Valerie. I really, really good to hear from all of you. Um, we we do we only have four minutes left. We don't have time for much. So I guess I would say a couple of things. One is um, the climate change response program is is as far as I know using the model developed at Devil's Tower to um, create metrics for individual parks at a, at a you know very site specific scale um, in advance of RSSs. So there's a lot of information out there if you're interested. Um, I, I hesitate to tell you who to contact because it'll probably be the wrong person, but probably just Kat or Larry, um, or you can contact you and you contact me, and I can hook you up with somebody. Um, but th those have been very useful to me in, in working with parks. And then I guess in the last couple of minutes, Larry, unless you have something more, are there any other questions that people raise? And if not, I'd love to get to our last 
couple of couple of slides, Tom. Yeah, on, right now we do not have any questions queued up, um, but I do want to let everyone know that's participating that all of our presenters and panelists today have graciously agreed to share their contact information with you. So we are happy to kick that out and we'll do so in a subsequent email and you can feel free to follow up with each of them individually if you do have any questions related to anything they discussed today or anything of pertinence in your park or the region. Before we uh, get out of here, I just wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about the two poll questions we had a little bit earlier that we asked you to fill in. And we asked those of you for a reason. Number one, uh, we did a study with CSU and the National Wildlife Federation back in 2012 sort of looking at audience beliefs and attitudes about climate change um, as it relates to national parks and refuges. And this is the study up in Kenai. Kenai Peninsula and the region was uh, one of the participating regions that Jeff mentioned earlier. And when we asked our park staff, just as we did you, how they thought their visitors perceived climate change, whether they were not concerned slightly somewhat, it's not surprising that we got a bell curve just the same way that we did when we polled everyone here. But what's striking and important to note is that we turned around and asked the same question of the visitors themselves. And as it turns out, visitors to parks and refuges are far more concerned about this topic than we sometimes give them credit for. And the reason we want to pull this out and make this really well known is that when it comes to your general public, your stakeholder groups, your uh, gateway communities, and your partner organizations, you've got real allies because they are seeing the action happen and the impacts happen on the front lines in the same way that you are, and they are motivated to act with you in response to this challenge. So just keep that in mind. I want to really take a moment and just extend the warmest thanks to all our participants online today, as well as all our panelists and presenters today, as well as the whole cast of characters that really work behind the scenes to pull off uh, this effort. Before we end the broadcast, um, I want to let you know that we're going to be sharing out a survey in a follow-up email. We request that you go ahead and take a moment to fill that out. Your responses really help improve each and every one of these offerings going forward. So in the days ahead, you can expect to receive both a follow-up email with links to the recorded webinar, contact information for all our presenters and panelists, and a few other goodies to share as well. Thank you all very much for joining us for today's roundtable. We'll leave you with a reminder in just a moment of key takeaways from the Southeast chapter, but I also want to remind you, or I should say the Northern Great Plains chapter, I do want to remind you that we'll be holding additional roundtables for each of the remaining NCA4 regions. We invite you to join those and view recordings from all of our past offerings as well, and we'll kick that link out into the chat room, into the chat box once again for you all. So with that, I really want to thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everybody.